Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Ken Miller. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the National and Global Asthma Management Guiding Principles. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the clinical educator at Lehigh Valley Health Network, and I've worked in respiratory therapy for about 47 years. So today, we're going to try to describe the evolution of asthma over the past several decades define the scientific methodology utilized in asthma management, and review uh, the current recommendations germane to asthma management. So that'll be our learning objectives today. So when you look at asthma uh, epidemiology, I mean, it's very prevalent, and there's a lot of individuals that unfortunately are diagnosed with asthma. Uh, there's 262 million individuals that, you know, as of 2023, are diagnosed with asthma. The mortality rate, uh, fortunately, remains fairly low. It remains at approximately 1%. However, not a lot of people die from asthma, but the burden and the cost of treating and managing asthma remains very, very high. Uh, this, this, even though, you know, we don't have a lot of patients dying of asthma, the you know the cost of asthma is tremendously high. In the United States alone, the indirect and direct management exceeds over three hundred billion dollars in cost, and it's estimated that globally, it's over six hundred and fifty billion dollars um, of cost. Now, again, you know when you look at indirect costs, that's like things like you know missing work, um, miss you know not being able to go to school. Um, trips to the doctor, gasoline, things like that. And then obviously direct management is the actual care of the asthmatic, you know, may that be anywhere from simple medications to complex hospitalization. Uh, so really to look at asthma management, you know, there had, there's two primary asthma resources out there. The National Asthma and Education Prevention Program, NAEPP, which was developed in 1989. And, and, and then there's the Global Initiative for Asthma Report, um, which is called GINA, and that was developed in 1993. The goals of these two governed bodies are to really increase the awareness of asthma, let both, you know, the community and healthcare providers understand what is asthma. You know, it's a chronic disease. It's an inflammatory disease, that type of awareness. Recon recognize the signs and symptoms of asthma. You know, what are the triggers of asthma? You know, what, you know, what does asthma look like when you're, when you're dealing with pathophysiology and symptomology? And ensure effective asthma control. Again, making sure you know, they're, you know, asthmatics are getting the right types of medications. They're utilizing it correctly and, you know, they're reducing the amount of triggers and, and other types of asthmatic causes. And, and it's also important that they want to enhance the quality of the life of people with asthma. The, you know, the, the goal is not to necessarily just get rid of the symptoms of asthma, but make sure that asthma does not interfere with the individual's daily life the um, ability to enjoy life and to try to reduce the amount of exacerbations and then obviously hospitalizations and obviously death. So when we look at the evolution of asthma management, it's been kind of a stepwise kind of progression over the last few decades. Um, 1960s, 1970s, it was really focused on treatment and prevention of bronchospasm. Uh, really the development of beta agonists. You know, some of the early agonists were things like isoprel, bronchosol, and uh, tabutaline, uh, metaprel. These were drugs that were very effective at treating a bronchospasm, but many of them also had unwanted side effects like uh, tachycardia, tachyphylaxis, and tremor. But really rescue beta agonists was the focus patient having an asthma, you know, starting to have an asthma symptoms, boom, boom, take an inhaler. 1980s to 1990s, there was a focus to move away from just the treatment of asthma or the response to asthma symptomology and try to focus on really 
the concept of chronic inflammation, the use of inhaled corticosteroids, ICSs, and also try to focus on trying to avoid asthma triggers. What are the triggers of asthma? Okay, how can we prevent asthma attacks from occurring? We know asthma is a chronic disease, but how can we prevent it from being a having exacerbations and having you know constant symptoms of asthma? So you really went from treatment of bronchospasm to try to control chronic inflammation. This is very important because again, it, 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 you as respiratory therapists need to really stress that even when asthmatics are asymptomatic, they still have asthma and they still have inflammation. Uh, currently, really we're looking at viewed as a heterogeneous disease, meaning that not all asthmatics are the same. And this leads to specialized individuals special individualized design action plans to try to deal with each asthmatic's unique needs or trigger avoidance, et cetera. And then also this is now the use of biological therapies. When you look at both the inhaled corticosteroids and the beta agonist um, treatments, those are you know, responses to the symptoms. With biological therapies, the idea is to try to uh, prevent and block any of the symptoms. So we don't have to worry about treating the symptoms. We can actually block the interleukins 4, 5, 23, and some of the other type of uh, cascading mediators that can cause asthma. I have another good lecture on a whole that talks about the whole concept of biologicals. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in this, in this but not in deep, deep detail. So this two panels, all right, try to use scientific methodology. They try to use objective and standardized approaches to formulate recommendations per on, you know, per evidence-based review. So what that means is they're trying to come out with a standard of care that can be used for most asthmatics and is shown to be very effective based on peer reviews and outcome studies, not on just opinion, but actually outcome studies. Uh, these panels are composed of lean asthma management experts. They have multidiscipline approach, respiratory therapists, pulmonologists, allergists, uh, nurses, uh, also case managers, uh, individuals that look at the, you know, the psychomatic or the stigma of asthma from a psychological standpoint. Uh, they work in collaboration with other committee experts like the American Thoracic Society, American Chest, ERS, the European Respiratory Society, probably the AARC also. And, and they develop a needs assessment profile based on recommendations and, and current evidence. And then they conduct quality and research follow-up based on the recommendations. So they keep track of you know, how are things working in asthma management. Are we reducing the amount of exacerbation, reducing the amount of, of ER visits, provider visits? How do we make sure that patients are complying with therapy? Can we work on making medications that are more palatable to the patient? You know, those type of things. So constantly these panels, uh, these two governing bodies are constantly looking at the literature, constantly trying to revise, adapt the best way of managing and prevent an asthma. Uh, review of current literature, you know, so these are the things that I'm going to talk about. So this is the most recent recommendations. Uh, so I'll break these down in, in, in categories and talk about them a little bit more in detail. And you can see, you know, there's a, you know, there's a nice little list here. You know, some of the things may be very common to you. Other, other of these may be somewhat foreign. So intermittent inhaled corticosteroids in children's less than sick. There's always been concerns of giving any type of steroids to children because it will reduce the growth plate. It can cause other type of problems. One, one of the issues is that asthma does affect about 7% of all children. And when you think about the number of children in the United States alone, that's a, you know, that's a voluminous amount of patients. Asthma is often difficult to, um, 
to, to, you know, is often difficult to diagnose from other childhood diseases oh, also, like bronchiolitis, foreign body aspiration, tracheomalacia, and uh, infant RSDS. So there's, there's, there, there, there is other diseases that manifest symptomology that is very similar to what the symptoms of asthma are, are. So to make sure that the child has asthma, the recommendation is that asthma diagnosis should be confirmed using a predictive index. Bronchodilatory response, you know, pre and post bronchodilatory spirometry, if possible. Uh, in sophophilia, you know, is there evidence of increased white blood cells and eosinophils that could show allergic type of type of response? And is there a family history of asthma? Is there a family history of having this type of you know diseases? You know, is is a is a dad or mom you know asthmatic? You know, brother, etc. And then the recommendation from these two governed bodies is that. If there's reoccurring weaves and mean that, you know, episodes are more than three times uh, a week or three times they've had to go to a provider because their child's been weaves in, a short um, course of inhaled steroids should be administered seven to 14 days. They do not recommend a, co a continuous use of inhaled corticosteroids in this patient population less than six, okay? And it always should be in conjunction with a short acting bronchodilator. So again, you know, the, the, there's a lot of concern about using inhaled corticosteroids and their recommendation is just like for adults sometimes, we'll use short burst of oral uh, steroids for exacerbation. They recommend seeing what this, um, you know, short course of inhaled steroids, you know, will, what the outcome is. Uh, there is some d discussion in these groups, but there is no recommendation that if the child seems to be stable on the inhaled steroids, maybe a low dose continuous inhaled steroid might be advocated, but that is not at all um, the recommendation at this point, just a short course, course to be attempted and make sure that the child definitely does have asthma and rule out the other etiologies. Intermittent maintenance and relief therapy. This is um, um, daily low dose inhaled cortical steroid and a PRN short acting bronchodilator. The, the, the term is called SMART, which includes, um, so the, that's, that's step two recommendation. The SMART concept that you'll hear more about as time is really to use a inhaled cortical steroid with a long acting bronchodilator as a single maintenance. So not to use um, your rescue inhaler as your single maintenance, but to use a low dose in, inhaled corticosteroid with a long acting bronchodilator, and then you only use your SABA um, as needed. But there is alternative therapies that can be included based on, again, this is where this heterogeneous model comes from, is those individuals that may have, you know, allergic asthma versus, you know, extrinsic versus intrinsic or certain type of triggers that are seasonal that may be alternative therapies would include leukotrin receptor antagonists. Uh, that would be kind of like Singulair, uh, Chromium or Theophylline could be also added. But again, the recommendation is the SMART concept where you use a inhaled corticosteroid for inflammation, and then use a long acting bronchodilator so you don't have to rely on the SABA use um, on a daily maintenance. And you can see this is um, the this is from Gina here, the persistent asthma daily medication stepwise. Okay, so um, you can see step two. Here is low dose inhaled corticosteroid, and then you have your alternatives. And then step three is where you come to the concept of SMART. Now you also know as you step wise, you increase, you increase, you increase interventions. So if you're at step four or higher in the sense of um, medic, you know, medication administration, 
make sure that at that point you should see an asthma specialist. You should, you know, not only rely on family medicine, but also now go to an expert in asthma management. Now, the other thing too, is you look over here, if step up is need, look at, check adherence, environmental control, core morbidities. This is what I'm saying about this heterogeneous plan. If a patient's obese, if a patient is in a, squan, a, a squalid environment, those things need to be taken care of because no matter what's done over this side, you're going to run into problems, all right? And then every three months, assess and see if you can uh, de-escalate if possible, all right? Uh, again, quick relief medications are indicated for all these groups, but if you're using it more than three treatments um, a week, then you need to really start looking at these different steps. And this is the um, this is from the national uh, board panel. And again, you know, personalized asthma management, controller, and preferred relievers. So in this, they recommend again, your step one is not to use your um, Saba, but to use inhaled corticosteroids. So your reliever here in this type of scenario is looking at always using inhaled corticosteroids as your reliever and then when you add a controller and alternative reliever that's where you would add this so you don't want to use this without ever initiating this only for exercise induced asthma if you have chronic asthma you should always be on some form of inhaled corticosteroid over the age of 12 and only use the reliever as needed and then it talks about other type of interventions you know, uh, cholinergic antagonists, again, looking at comorbidities, uh, symptom control, risk factors, you know, education, skill training, you know, it, it's very important. But I like his circle here. It's, you know, it's like assess, adjust, review. And that's the concept of this type of cyclic, you know, care and management of the patient. We assess them, we adjust, we review. Three months, three months later, reassess, readjust, and then continue the review. Exercise pre-treat with single maintenance and relief therapy. 98% uh, of asthmatics experience exercise induced asthma. Um, recommendations again to use that low dose um, inhaled corticosteroid with a PRN SABA. So if I know that I'm going to go out and run and it's going to be cold out, the recommendation is to continue to use your low dose, which you which you should be chronically on, and then use a rescue uh, therapy prior to going out and doing the exercise. Or if you do the exercise and you become wheezy, uh, then do it afterwards, whichever um, works best for the patient. But there's really no benefit in adding a long acting bronchodilator in this group because the stimulus or the trigger is exercise. Now we're not gonna, you know, some people would say, well, that's not exercise then, but that's not really what we want because exercise has many benefits, both physiologically and psychologically. So I think it's very, very important to um, think about, you know, maybe pre-medicating yourself or definitely have a SABA if you know that certain exercise and certain conditions is, you know, I have asthma and I do know that when I was younger and running, I could guarantee any time the temperature was less than 32, uh, and it was, you know, especially with was dry and uh, out and cold, that, that always irritated my lungs. So that's a recommendation for exercise pretreatment with single maintenance, which is the low inhaled corticosteroid and relief therapy, which would be your SABA. Um, now, this is something that I've done over the years and people, <laughs> I've had providers argue with me, there was no evidence. Well, now there seems to be some evidence is that uh, for those individuals that are on a daily ICS, so let's say they're on um, Advair, uh, 100 over 50, you know, just 100 of Advair, okay? They argue the point that if you have some type of exacerbation, so let's say you get a cold on top of having asthma or you get the flu, is considering doubling or tripling the dosage during the, the asthma exacerbation. Um, seven to 14 days dosing. So again, I'm on 250 and 50 of Advair. I would for two weeks maybe do 500 and 250. 
all right? Uh, some, you know, 100 might go to 250 uh, and that. So you usually 100, 250, 500 for AdVair. So th there are some more studies that need to be done to determine the exact dose and regime and how we you should do this. But there is a recommendation for both groups that um, there is some evidence and some patients, including myself, um, have found this to be very effective in reducing the severity of the, ex uh, of the exacerbation of asthma. So again, it's a short team increase, not, you know, not, you know, if you have to, you know, continue it, then, you know, you definitely should be in contact with your provider, uh, explain that you've done this. And then if you're still having asthmatic, then you need to go and see if maybe oral corticosteroids or some other interventions need to be done. Now, there's been a lot of talk about looking at long-acting muscoscarian antagonists or anticholinergic agents, you know, things like um, Atrovent is the most common years ago was atropine, uh, because you look at the mechanism of, of bronchodilatation, your, bronchi your beta agonist drugs increase cyclic 3, 5 prime A and P, which cause dilatation. Your antagonists, to the opposite in the sense that they block the constrictor, okay, with his, which is GPM35 prime. So the idea would be is if you have, you know, airway inflammation, hypersecretions, and smooth muscle contraction, the vagus nerve, which controls the neural transmitters and secretes acetylcholine in the submucosal glands, the smooth muscle, and epithelial cells, it can result in bronchospasm hypersecretion. So the idea would be these long acting uh, lamas, as they're called, block the release of acetylcholine and thus prevent bronchospasm hypersecretion. They don't dilate, they block the constrictors. And they may be useful as an add on therapy in po poorly controlled asthma with other established medications. So again, this should never be considered to be a first. Um, type of uh, first uh, treatment regime or a standalone, you should always use this in conjunction with the inhaled corticosteroid and your either SABAs or LABAs. But the idea is there may be patients that can benefit from this without being on oral steroids or other types of more, you know, side effect or, or you know, problematic type of uh, interventions. Uh, again, there's you know, some conflicting data that says this doesn't help, but this, these, these two panels argue the point that um, the cost benefit of this is, is pretty low in the sense that there's not a lot of side effects associated with this. Uh, and to try this probably would be, you know, something worthy to attempt in refractory groups. Again, an add-on therapy, not a conventional therapy. And again, this is, an example, this is a real fancy name here for um, Atrovent. And you can see the idea is that, that it blocks these type of mediators, which would cause bronchoconstriction or increased mucosal uh, secretion. So again, it inhibits mucus secretion and it really uh, form, you know, kind of formulates and promotes bronchodilatation from blocking the uh, enzyme that causes bronchospasm. So it works off the parasympathetic. Exhaled nitric oxide as an assessment tool has gained a lot of popularity over the last um, few years. And, you know, it, it, again, it's very inexpensive and it's non-invasive way of measuring airway inflammation in asthmatic. So it's a non-invasive way to assess and monitor airway inflammation in asthma. Um, anything greater than 50 parts per million in non-smokers is associated with in eosinophilic airway inflammation. So it should be less than 50. You know, it's going to be altered if you've been smoking cigarettes uh, or you did smoke for a while. And it's become a very effective a very effective um, monitor to uh, look at how effective inhaled corticosteroids are. So Ken Miller has been diagnosed with asthma and he's put on Advir 250, all right? And then 
you look at what my inflammation is after a period of maybe three months of using the inhaled steroid, and ideally the FENO would drop in value. All right. And, and, and it is very, very much recommended by both panels as a useful tool to monitor asthma in um, medication effectiveness or, pa or patient compliance. So it's really the recommendation from this, these two panels is to use this as a monitor, monitoring device, how effective, how compliant the patient is. All right. It is not at all recommended to use in diagnosis or predicting development of asthma. Uh, pulmonary function testing, uh, they're still the standard in diagnostic management, pre and post bronchodilers, FEV1s, those type of things. So there is some, you know, um, there, there, there are some clinicians out there that use uh, FENO as a way of pred predicting asthma. Well, it's a low number, so you can't have asthma. You, you can't do that. that. That's not the recommendation. Is once you establish the asthma diagnosis, you can use the FENO as a monitoring tool, but not as a diagnostic tool. So that's the recommendation. And for those that haven't seen it, just an example of a patient utilizing one of these devices. And there you can see the tracheobronchial tree, um, and it'll give you a measurement. Now, indoor allergen uh, mitigation is very, very important because we do know that one of the current concepts and one of the cons uh, current really uh, emphasis is trying to prevent asthma triggers or reducing asthma triggers. So you look at control of environmental factors as an integral part of asthma, uh, of asthma management because it makes no difference how many medications are given to the patient if the trigger of the inflammation and the trigger of the bronchospasm remains. So if Ken Miller goes and gets put on, you know, oral steroids and I go back into a very, you know, dusty environment, or I know that eating shell, uh, shell food, uh, seafood with shells on like shrimp and uh, lobster is going to cause me to go into bronchospasm and I continue to do that, uh, the medications are not going to be very effective and it could be actually life-threatening. So common indoor allergens include dust mites, pet danders, moles, and even uh, pest feces. Now, the, some of the things they recommend that you know mitigation could include things like impermeable mil, a pill and a mattress covers. So uh, these mites and um, danders can't get really onto the pillows. Uh, pest eradication and management and animal dander sensitivity. If, you know, it's hard to say to someone to get rid of their pet because pets are loved ones to many people. Um, so if you're going to have an animal that you're sensitive to, like a dog, cat, then they recommend that you get some kind of immunological sensitivity so you don't react as uh, violently. And again, you know, um, common indoor allergies, house dust. Well, if you know you got to clean your house, that is on by uh, mold spores, you know, uh, musky, damp basements, uh, certain fabrics, certain fabric cleaners, dust mites, pat denders, and then obviously everybody's aware of the cockroaches and the cockroach dander and drop ins. This is really unfortunate in lower economic groups. And it's, you know, like a lot of us look at this and say, well, we can avoid, we can avoid. But a lot of people can avoid these things because of their social economic um, situation. They just can't get up and move or they don't have the money to, you know, change their environment. And these are 10 ways to curb hidden allergens at home. So again, these are some of the things they recommend to uh, asthmatic patients or asthmatic, you know, parents of a child is, you know, how do we reduce the allergens the best we can? Can you can't necessarily just you know, move out of your house or you just can't move somewhere else or you just can't, you know, get rid of the whole environment. But what can we do? What can we do? So like number nine here, use salad flooring like tiles, wood, and aluminiums versus using rugs. Uh, exhaust fans in the kitchen and bathroom, get rid of moisture and fumes. Uh, HEPA filters, humidity, you know, too much humidity 
increases mole and dust, you dehumidifier. I have two of those in my basement going, you know, because if I don't, I'll get a lot of mold in my basement. Uh, taking off your shoes, avoiding track and allergens, especially if you're walking through fields that might have things like a going rod or other type of irritants. You know, enjoy your pet, but try to keep it out of your sleeping area. Um, you know, skip the wood, burn in, you know, uh, fireplaces, don't smoke inside. Certain scents, candles can trigger. So you have to figure out what, you know, is your main triggers, but there are steps to to do. And some of them are unpopular, but you have to balance between, you know, you know, pleasures of life versus your health. But again, this is a recommendation now today is not only treat patients with medications, but try to really zone in on what are the triggers, what's making these asthmatics, you know, have attacks or or having symptoms. Um, immunotherapy. So 40% um, of all asthmatics also have some form of allergic rhinitis. Uh, they asthma exacerbations can be exposed, you know, can be caused by exposure to specific allergens in certain seasons like ragweed, you know, hay fever. Recommendations and immunotherapy as a treatment office is uh, if the allergen plays a role in asthma. So if, the, if, if every fall or every spring, Ken Miller gets exacerbations based on certain type of allergens, well, let's try to see what we can do about reducing and desensitizing the response to the allergen. These things can be administered subcutaneously, uh, sublingually, some of them IV. Um, no studies that demonstrate a reduction in provider visits, improving quality of life, and ER visits. So even though these are common, th you know, common therapies, there's really lack of evidence that they actually do actually improve um, quality of life, reduce visits, and, and things like that. So you know, there's a lot of popularity but there's not a much, a lot of evidence. But they are still recommended by both of these panels based on the fact that is, you know, considered to be a standard of care. And, you know, it, it again, it, it lot depends on, you know, patient A, patient B, what's their therapy going to be is based on one, can they, you know, do they have to, you know, go somewhere to get it done? Uh, can they do it themselves? How frequent it is? What is the cost of it? You know, things like that all make the, you know, you know, make the choice in what kind of path they're going to take. So like this here, treatment A, infusion of the skin at home. This is versus a clinic. These are four needle sticks. This is two needle sticks once per week, every four weeks. So again, um, when you look at times per, per month, here's 17 hours it takes to do this where this one only takes four hours. So you can see. Now bronchial thermoplasty is, is a therapy that had kind of gained some popularity a decade ago. And, and what happens here, this bronchoscopy therapy delivers local radio frequency to the airways. And it the it what the idea is that the extracellular matrix caused by constant inflammation thickens and becomes refractory to bronchodilatation or uh, inhaled or even oral steroids. So what happens is even though you're given uh, medications for inflammation, they are somewhat less effective because of this thickened inflammation. Now, uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of hype about this and there was a lot of uh, interest and uh, anticipation that this could really help. But what they saw was that based on the evidence and based on the little, you know, the, the minor improvement that patients have for a small time period compared to the side effects, which can include bleeding, infection, atelectasis. And as I said, there's not really any long-term benefit for in five years based on these, um, the cost, and also the chance of side effects. They do not re they do not at all uh, recommend this uh, for refractory asthma. They've kind of leaned more towards the biological agents at this point. For those that haven't seen it, uh, this is the Alar tip is a heated 
um, temperature almost over 100 degrees centigrade. And the idea is it burns the thickened airways, so then the airways become more responsive to medications and also increase the airway lumen. Yeah, this is a you know airway of a patient of an individual without asthma, patient with severe asthma. You can see this mod this uh, modulation of the airway is very thickened, so the lumen becomes very small, and then you you burn this away, which then allows the lumen to be comes up after BT, the inside wall, and the tissue heal, and and the airway muscle is reduced. Okay, so. Again, Allair is it burns away this type of modulated matrix of thickened airway, secondary to uh, airway inflammation. But again, not recommended. And to be honest with you, I know we were doing it at our institution uh, for a while. We were part of a trial, but I, I really haven't heard much uh, about it in the last few years. Now, ending up, we'll talk about COVID and um, 19 and asthma. So respiratory viruses are a very common trigger that cause an exacerbation. Um, what the data showed was asthmatics who were well controlled had no greater risk of acquiring COVID than non asthmatic. So as asthma itself is not a risk factor in developing COVID um, if the asthma is well controlled, meaning that the patient it, or the individuals on their medication and they are uh, pretty well without symptoms. There was no increased risk or hospitalization in this group um, or death with asthma. So when you again you look at co comorbidities or confounding type of risk factors, asthma was not one of them. Uh, those that were at risk was uncontrollable asthma. Those that had a history of exacerbations more than four times a year uh, and had at least two hospitalizations for asthma. Uh, diabetics, cardiovascular disease, ob obesity, and um, non-vaccinated. And vaccinated is, is recommended in this um, patient population, in the uh, asthma popu population. But again, um, those that had control that, and this was a big fear of me because I have asthma and obviously working with COVID-19 patients, I was very, very scared that I could get a, um, you know, have an increased risk of asthma, of death or even getting COVID. But, you know, fortunately I, I, I did okay. But again, you know, there was a lot of trepidation and the data is pretty strong showing that asthma by itself is not a risk factor of one getting COVID and to um, dying from COVID. So I, I think in conclusion here, um, both these two groups, national expert uh, panel and the global initiative of asthma are valuable resources that make recommendation on best mas um, asthma management practices. I, I think uh, you'll find these you know, this information go online and there's oodles and oodles. I think the GINA document alone is, I think, about 45 pages. So it's really, it's really um, quite informative. It, 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 there's a tremendous amount of energy and time uh, taken to try to come up with best practices and standards on asthma management. I think we as healthcare providers um, need to keep aware of the change in asthma management recommendations. Uh, I think it's very, very important to do that. And I, I think it's important that we tell our patients that even if they don't have symptoms and they have asthma, they still have asthma, okay? It does, asthma does not go away because you don't wheeze. It's there's still inflammation being generated. So that inflammation needs to be kept under control Asthma management is, is, is evolutionary and will continue to adapt based on new evidence and new recommendations. I think we're very fortunate to have this type of uh, group, these two panels around that can constantly try to fine tune and you know maximize the recommendations and the care of our asthmatic patient populations. 
So again, I want to thank you for um, listening to his presentation. I want to thank you for, um, you know, being a respiratory therapist. And again, thank you for everything you do. And I hope this was informative. And here are some references that again will be very helpful and kind of where I got the information from for this presentation. Um, there's again, as I said, a tremendous amount of information if you go to both the uh, national experts and you go to the GINA uh, websites, you will find tremendous amount of information that may be able to help you uh, treat your asthmatics better.